Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from. My name is Dolph Michel. I'm the creative producer for The Braid and your Zoom master for this morning's event. Please let us know in the chat where you're located and where you're tuning in from so we can see all the different locations people are in the world. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. If this is your first time, welcome. Uh, if you're a returning patron, welcome back. We're so glad to have you. I have a few housekeeping reminders before we begin. Uh, your audio function is set to mute. That's just to ensure we don't have any accidental interruptions uh, for our panelists and moderator. This event is being recorded and will be available later on on our website to watch back or to share with family and friends. If you need a closed captioning, please hit the CC button at the bottom. Text will pop up on your screen and you can enlarge it and move it around on the screen to your liking. Lastly, we will be having a Q&A at the end of our conversation. So if you have any questions for Susan, please feel free to chat me and I'll be fielding those and get to as many as I can. Now I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Lisa Rosenbaum. Hello, Lisa. Hi, thanks, Daphna. Well, welcome everyone to Sunday with the Braid. Um, th today we're going to start in a little bit of a different way. We're going to begin our program about Yiddish in America with a short video clip. Um, it tells a story that seems to me to be the perfect introduction to uh, my conversation today with Susan Bronson of the Yiddish Book Center. So let's watch the video. When uh, my mother's mother came to America, she was carrying with her a valise in which she had everything she had brought with her from the old country. Her older brother met her and took the suitcase and he flung it overboard. Her photographs of her parents, her clothing, uh, her Shabbos candlesticks, everything she had with her was thrown out. He understood that the price of admission to America was to throw the old country away. But I think for my generation, I am finally secure enough in my Americanism that I can now go back and I can dredge the harbor and I can find the suitcase that was thrown out. That was the voice of Aaron Lansky who in the process of finding his grandmother's suitcase founded an entire movement uh, to rescue uh, Yiddish literature and culture. That was in the 1970s. And he started it by creating uh, what became the Yiddish Book Center in Ma Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, my guest today is Susan Bronson, who has been the executive producer, executive director, excuse me, of that center since 2010. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. Um, well, let me just begin by saying that, you know, for those who aren't very familiar with the Yiddish Book Center, um, can you just give us a little thumbnail sketch of, you know, how it came to be and, and what its mission is? Sure, sure. So Aaron Lansky, whose voice you heard, um, founded the Yiddish Book Center when he was 23 years old. He was in graduate school up in Montreal. He was studying Yiddish literature, getting a master's degree. Uh, and he couldn't find Yiddish books for his classwork. So he put up some signs in the neighborhood and, and the books started pouring in. And ultimately he decided he would take a leave of absence from grad school and save some Yiddish books. Well, it turned into much more than a leave of absence from grad school because here we are 43 years later, uh, <laughs> having rescued more than a million and a half Yiddish books from dumpsters, from basements, from shuls, from schools, and from places all over, literally all over the world, Yiddish books have come to us. So that, that decision to take a leave of absence turned into a much bigger enterprise. So that's really how, how the Yiddish Book Center started. Um, that was in 1980 when the center was founded as a nonprofit. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, we've, we've been growing and evolving ever since then. Wow. But, you know, you, I understand that you have a PhD in Russian history and Jewish history. I'm just wondering, right. you know, what, what drew you to this, this kind of work? What, what interested you about Yiddish? Well, I, I would say it's not so much about Yiddish language per se, but more about the whole universe and world that Yiddish represents. So Yiddish was the spoken language of Jews for more than a thousand years. 
And um, as a, somebody who is trained as a historian, you know, you can't study a people without understanding the language they spoke. And you can't learn about who Ashkenazi Jewish people were without knowing something about Yiddish language and culture. So, you know, and of course, with my personal background, my grandparents spoke Yiddish, even though they didn't want us to know that they spoke Yiddish and they didn't want us to understand it. I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in the 60s and 70s at a time when, you know, many of the grandparents of my, my friends were Yiddish speakers. I felt very connected personally to the history. And professionally, I had worked a lot in nonprofit arts management and culture. So when the job at the Yiddish Book Center opened up, it really felt like the perfect marriage of my personal academic and professional worlds. They were all coming together. And it's just been a really fabulous ride working for this incredible organization. I bet. <laughs> Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the books themselves. I mean, I'm sure you know most of our audience here has probably heard of Shalom Aleichem, maybe Shalom Ash, um, Isaac Besheva Singer, um, but you have a vast library, and uh, it, it it incorporates. I mean, what what are these books? What kind right. of right? So are I mean, it's fascinating. We think there are probably about forty five or fifty thousand titles in in Yiddish literature. Our collection, we have probably about. 12,000 titles here, which are, were the most popular books that Jews read. I mean, imagine if you decided you were going to rescue books from Americans' homes, you would get a lot of bestsellers, right? So, so our collection, by virtue of the fact that we were taking books from people who had them all over the world, they were the most popular books. Um, but there are many, many more uh, in collections, uh, some other major collections like Yivo in New York, the National Library of Israel, uh, and New York Public have some other very, very large collections, but they represent everything from novels to, um, you know, to scientific tracts, to uh, how to's, there were citizenship guides in Yiddish, there's theater in Yiddish, there's poetry volumes, everything you would imagine in any literature exists in Yiddish literature and also many translations. So just to give you an idea, I mean, we recently got a very rare translation into Yiddish of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Um, Jews were reading Shakespeare in Yiddish. Jews were reading many, many other great writers in other languages in Yiddish. So it, it's really a vast and rich collection. And what's fascinating is that for many, many years, um, everyone knows, as you mentioned, just a few names. I mean, think about that, how, in some ways, how shocking that is, right? You have this incredible literary outpouring. I mean, you have thousands and thousands of titles, a great world literature, and even Jewish people, the people of the book, don't actually know that literature. We may know a few mm -hmm. authors, but we don't really know. And even scholars of the literature, I mean, it, it's fascinating that for many years, many scholars studied all the same books. And what's happened at the Yiddish Book Center is we've digitized 12,000 titles. So there are many, many books in our digital collection that people didn't have access to before. And many younger scholars today, not just younger scholars, but it, it certainly is a lot of younger scholars who are exploring that, mining that, and discovering books, or I should say rediscovering books because they were in their day read, but, um, rediscovering books that that uh, you know even top scholars in the field don't really know about so we're really it's 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 kind of like a great treasure hunt to see what's in this literature and to open it up to new generations and I would say that is you know you talked about how we were founded and how we got started and really what we're trying to do now is create make that make that world accessible and open those books up both literally and metaphorically to new audiences yeah, yeah. Well, I know, you know, Aaron Lansky wrote a book, which I think somebody yes. already in the chat mentioned, Outwitting History, which is a yes. great title. Um, this language that was supposed to be dying, uh, eternally supposed to be dying, has not died at all. Um, and even in, you know, in the post-Holocaust era where people were sort of pivoting towards Hebrew, um, Yiddish somehow remained alive. And today, you know, we have now we are now seeing a, a revival of Yiddish theater. They they had Fiddler in, on the Roof in Yiddish. Um, there's a, Theater J is, has a whole uh, program for Yiddish theater. Uh, the Forward, which my grandfather used to read, now has a Yiddish section. And there are all these young people who are 
studying Yiddish and, and are engaged with Yiddish. I'm just wondering, you know, why do you think this is? Well, I think there are a variety of reasons for this. And first, let me say that there are many, there are the, the Hasidic community speaks Yiddish as its daily language, right? So Absolutely. you have religious communities that are speaking Yiddish. And what we're really talking about is a renaissance in of secular Yiddish, for want of a better word, right? And, and so I think this is happening for a variety of reasons. I mean, first, um, you know, as a historian, I'll speak again to the fact that, you know, for many, many years when people studied Jewish studies, it was Judaic studies. It was the study of the Jewish religion. Um, along with many other fields, there was an opening up of something that we, we call social history, which is studying people, studying the lives of people. Well, as I said before, you can't study the lives of Jewish people without studying Yiddish or knowing something about Yiddish. But then there's some other things going on. I mean, I think, you know, whereas the generation of my grandparents or, you know, and, and immigrants of that generation really just wanted to become Americans and assimilate, I think there's a different dynamic now. Young people want to know where they come from. They want to identify strongly with the cultural and ethnic identity, and they want to find ways to do that. And I think for many young Jews, Yiddish is a way to do that. For many young Jews, they may, may not be interested in religious life. They may not, I mean, we all know the tensions around Israel and, and you know, we won't get into that here, but I, for a lot of young people, they're looking for other ways to connect to a sense of Jewish identity. And Yiddish provides that, Yiddish language and culture provides that. And I'll also add that a lot of young people are attracted to Yiddish as a language of radicalism and a yet language of activism. I mean, in, in, in Jewish history, of course, there, there's a real radical tradition, uh, labor, the labor movement, the Bund, socialism, and young people today are interested in reconnecting to that history, and Yiddish is a way to do that as well. Um, so I think there are a lot of threads coming together here that are driving uh, a, a renaissance in interest in, in, in not just Yiddish language, because many people won't learn the Yiddish language, but there are lots of ways to access the culture, and that's also experiencing a renaissance. Yeah, well, speaking of accessing, um, you know, a lot, a lot of us, including myself, I don't read Yiddish. I don't speak it right. either. Um, but I would, I started to read more plays and, and uh, literature in, thanks in part to the Yiddish Book Center. I just would like you to talk a little bit about how the Yiddish Book Center is making this body of literature accessible to non-Yiddish readers. Um, right, well, I would say, in, right, in many ways, that's the majority of our work. I mean, we do mm -hmm. teach Yiddish and we're very eager to, and I, I will take this opportunity to showcase, we produced a new Yiddish language, whoops, doesn't really show up, yeah, a new yeah. Yiddish language textbook, um, <laughs> which is a really wonderful resource for people who do want to learn Yiddish, and we offer Yiddish classes, but for most people who won't do that, um, we have a huge amount that's available through both virtual public programs, through a whole host of things on our website, and most notably now through a whole translation initiative that we've undertaken. So we're training a new generation of translators and we're publishing new translations of Yiddish literature. So, mm -hmm. there, so we're really excited to, to try to engage people with the literature and the culture without necessarily ever you're learning Yiddish. And there are just a, a whole host of ways to do that. Um, very yeah. most excited, we, we have a new publishing imprint called White Goat Press. And we have 14 new titles just this year alone that will be coming out. So um, if you're looking for great reads in Yiddish, <laughs> it's not hard to find great reads of Yiddish literature. It's not hard to find them in English these are days. They, in, they are in translation. So in translation, in right. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're uh, you know, we're, we're, we're publishing, uh, we're training translators because of a, a generation of translators, older translators, who, you know, we need new younger people who are going to be translating the work and engaging with the work. And uh, so we're publishing these new translations and trying to put them out to new audiences. We have a reading group where, you know, we send you reading resources and all kinds of ways to connect to your peers and read these books together. Um, you know, we do... Uh, we do public programs much like this one, you know, Zoom programs where we talk about all kinds of things related to Yiddish literature and culture. 
Uh, and, and if you just explore our website, you can, you can go down a rabbit hole and find yourself, uh, you know, just exploring all kinds of stuff, Yiddish in translation and, and information about, uh, about Yiddish culture and language and recorded public programs. And of course, if you read Yiddish, you can find thousands of books in Yiddish and also many, many um, recorded talking books in Yiddish and, and so much more. Yeah, I, I want to say that having look, I, I would encourage everybody to take a look at the website for the Yiddish Book Center. It is not just one rabbit hole. It is like hundreds. Um, there's so much there. But on top of it, I've been enjoying uh, listening to the podcast, The Schmooze. Right. You get a whole view of li Yiddish literature and conversations about that. And also Pockentrager, which is your, your magazine, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, and, and has usually has a um, something in translation within it, but it's they're they're just beautiful articles. You guys do really great work. <laughs> Thank you um, so much. And yeah. Pocket Traeger is our member magazine. So if right. you're a so member join. of the Yiddish Book Center, you get Pocket Traeger, and we of course love people to join. That's my little my little pitch for the day. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we provide almost everything for free, and you can you can go to the website. You can you can uh, come to our public programs. And one other wonderful thing that we do is we have this amazing oral history project where we've interviewed more than uh, 1,200 people and counting one to two hour interviews. And they're all searchable and they're all up on the website. And it's a wonderful way to connect to the many people, both ordinary people and famous people who have some connection to Yiddish language and culture. You know, mm. ordinary stories of people's lives, but also people like Leonard Nimoy, who we interviewed, who, who reads in Yiddish. And it's just it's just fabulous. So you really can dive in and, and, and find a lot just just by exploring. Okay. Well, one thing that I think a lot of people are not aware of is that Yiddish literature was not just written by men. There were many Yiddish women writers, um, particularly poets. Um, and so I thought in the interest of showcasing the women writers, uh, today we will have um, a reading by our very own Arva Rose, who is a, a Abby Freeman artist in residence with the, with the Brave. And Arva's going to read a poem that I found on the Yiddish Book Center's website. It's by Pessy Pomeranz Honigbaum. It's called Red Dew, and it was translated by Jessica Kurzane. Um, we'll first hear it in um, in English and then in Yiddish. She was actually uh, born in the the Russian Pale of Settlement, but came to the United States in um, two thousand uh, no the turn of the century, um, and she was very very active in the Yiddish book Yiddish um, Chicago scene. Um, and so this poem sort of reflects something of her own sadness about leaving the Jews of Europe behind, but also her love of nature. Um, so with that, um, I would love to hear Red Dew. Um, Arva, you're up. My children. Green leaves in the wind, satin smooth, vernally green. Knife-like winds cuts through the day. Red dew drips from the world's dawn. Do not quiver in the cold. My children, illumined gold. Do not tear yourself from your own stem nor cry in dusty byways flown adrift. My children, in the slaughter knife wind, red dew drips from the world's dawn. Don't be uprooted by the slashing wind. Grow stronger, green, brighter. The lacerating day will not last long, nor long will there be bloodthirsty hate. Cling tighter to your ancient roots. Tomorrow's sun will shine and glow with new flame. Tomorrow's sun will glow with new flame. Thick trunks 
with sturdy branches will grow tall. The blazing sun will shine over the world. My children, do not doubt, nor freeze in the cold. Kinder meine, Blätter grüne in dem Welt, Sonne start und Frühling dick zu grint. Es schneit der Heint nicht messer dicker Wind, Reute toi von Welts Frühmorgen rind, nur nicht zittern, nur tricken in von Geld. Kinder meine, lichtig. Aufgehelt, sich nicht abreisen von Stammen eigene und nicht weinen auf verstäubete Wegen wie verfleugene. Kinder meine, in dem heiligen Wind, heute toi von Welts Frühmorgen rund, sich nicht auswurzeln von Messer dicker Wind. Starker wachsen, lichtige zu grint. Nicht auf lang wird teure Messer dicker Hand. Nicht auf lang wird leuren Blut durch dicker Feind. Starker kleimet sich und durchaus dicken Stamm. Morgen wird der Glieton Sohn mit neuem Flamm. Morgen wird a Glieton Sohn mit neuem Flamm. Wird voneinander blieben breit verzweigte Stamm. Sohn wird flammendicker leuchten über Welt. Kinder meine, nicht verzweifeln und nicht glibbern von Kelt. Oh. Thank you so much, Arva. That was just, it's beautiful to hear it. You know, even I, I don't understand it, but I feel it in my heart. <laughs> um, it's just beautiful. Thank you. Um, you know, Susan, you you had a conference, I understand, years ago about Yiddish and uh, women in Yiddish literature. And I, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit, are there books, are there anthologies of women's literature available to people? Yeah, I mean, I'll say that um, actually we just did, there was a conference 25 years ago that we didn't sponsor called Die Freuen, which was which was a bunch of academics who were interested in Yiddish and, 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 and uh, women writers who wanted to put forward the contributions of Yiddish. We just held a, a program uh, last year to commemorate the 25th anniversary of that conference. We brought together many of the original participants and then a new generation who's trying to lift up the voices of Yiddish women writers. And I would say it's actually a misconception that women just wrote poetry. It was sort of a male thing to think, oh, poetry is a woman's thing and that's what women write and, and that's what women did. When in actuality, what we've discovered not we, I mean, um, <laughs> we, I'm not al along with many uh, academics and scholars and younger people who are who are going through our, our digital library and also the archives at Evo discovering, oh my gosh, you know, women wrote novels and um, they didn't necessarily receive their due in their day. Uh, and there are many of these now being published, some through our translation initiative. Last year, we published an autobiographical novel called Dina. Um, it's written by Ida Maza, who was better known as a poet, but she also wrote this novel and it was translated by Yerma Yahu Arantau and it's available on, at our bookstore. I happen to have it right here. Beautiful book, <laughs> wonderful autobiographical novel. Um, there's one of our translation fellows, uh, uh, Alvar just read the poem by, um, by uh, which was translated by Jessica Kierzing. Jessica was one of our fellows. She's also a professor at University of Chicago. And she's been translating the work of another woman novelist. Her name is Miriam Karpilov. And one of the books she wrote was uh, translated was called Diary of a Lonely Girl, all, also available in our bookstore and a fabulous book. Um, we're, we're publishing soon, next year, we're publishing um, the memoir of Rachel Auerbach, who was part of the Oynig Shabbos group. The Oynig Shabbos group was a group that buried 
an archive in the Warsaw ghetto during the during uh, and that archive was unearthed. There's been a book written about that archive. There was a movie called Who, Who Will Write Our History um, about that archive. Well, Rachel Auerbach was a member of the Oinig Shabbos and she wrote a memoir which has not been translated and, and a wonderful scholar, Sam Cassow, is translating that memoir and that will be published in January. So it's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there have been a lot of these coming out. Anita Norwich, who was a professor at the University of Michigan, who retired from her teaching work not that long ago and is sort of dedicating herself now to finding these women writers. So she's combing our collection. She's combing the Carrick catalog at YIVO. And she discovered recently a, a, a Hannah Blankstein, another writer oh. who wrote Fear and Other Stories, which has been published. I'm and, reading them now. <laughs> okay, wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and soon we'll also be putting out another woman who is better known as a poet. She discovered a novel by Celia Dropkin, who was a well-known Yiddish poet, but she, Celia Dropkin wrote a novel called Two Feelings that we're going to be publishing. So it really, it really is a moment where um, these women are receiving hopefully their due and, uh, and, and will be recognized as also great writers in, in Yiddish literature, not only the, the sort of the men that we've all heard of, um, Singer and, and, and Sholem Aleichem and Peretz and, and many of the others. So hopefully it's, it's a new day for women Yiddish writers and they'll, uh, people will enjoy reading them. And of course, they're presenting a different perspective. And these books are very modern, I would add. I think people have a notion that they're going to be reading some book that is going to only be talking about, I don't know, the 19th century or something like that. Many of these are post-Holocaust. So they're, they, they, they're quite contemporary and they deal with very contemporary themes and, and I think are, are quite compelling. Yeah. Even the ones that are pre-Holocaust are very yes. modern. I mean, that is one of the things that is, to me, has been the most striking thing. Um, and all of Yiddish literature is really modern. I mean, these are Jews who are not writing from a religious perspective. They're writing post, you know, in an emancipated period. Well, um, that's how the literature emerged, really. I mean, yeah. it, it's a product of the Haskalah, the emancipation. And, uh, you know, many of the themes, again, I think this, this is why a lot of young people are finding the work engaging, because many of the themes are themes that people would deal with today. How does one live as a Jew in the modern world? Uh, you know, they're, they're, these questions that are, are, are perennial questions for Jews, I think, uh, are reflected in the literature in many ways. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just wondering, um, we're talking about Yiddish in translation that people are now translating. Is anybody writing in Yiddish now? Are, are there yes. New yes. Um, I, well, first of all, again, in the Hasidic community, there is literature being written for that community in Yiddish. But there yeah. are also people writing in Yiddish, uh, both in Israel and in the United States, um, writing new work in Yiddish. It's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon for, for yes. a new audience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, you know, what do you think, this is maybe sort of a more philosophical question, but why, why do you think the preservation of Yiddish is particularly important um, in contemporary America? What's unique about it as opposed to maybe other immigrant languages being preserved? Well, I don't think it's necessarily more important than any language being preserved, but I think that, um, look, I, I think that, uh, it's important. I mean, I'm a historian, so I care about history and I care about culture. And I think culture matters and it should matter. Um, I'm, you do too, because you represent an organization that's all about storytelling and, and theater and all of these ways in which we, we engage with our cultural life. And so I think Yiddish is no different. And the notion, again, going back to something I said earlier, I mean, the notion that there is this vast literature that was produced over a hundred years, more than a hundred years, that that we, uh, I say, I'll say we as, it's, as somebody who is Jewish, but of course it's not just a literature for Jews, but the notion that this literature exists and even Jews don't know about it, the notion that, you know, we're a people who care about perpetuating our culture and our history and the idea that we sort of leave this part out is just, it's crazy. 
So, you know, and, and there, there are all the, I mean, many of you might have heard of the Pew study. So Pew is a foundation that does a survey every number of years. And one of the surveys is about, you know, how did Jews see themselves and what do they care about? Well, what Pew observes is that 90% uh, of Jews identify as culturally Jewish, right? And many people are wringing their hands about how do we engage in a, a younger generation in Jewish life. Well, from the perspective of the Yiddish Book Center, what we do and represent is a key pillar of how we engage a new generation in Jewish life. And you speak to theater. I mean, we're really excited about the work being done with Yiddish theater. And in fact, one of the books that we're going to be publishing is a translation of three plays of Sholem Ash, which are, haven't been translated. We work a lot with a wonderful, um, with a wonderful performer and translator, uh, um, Karen O'Brien, fascinating story. Karen is an alum of our program where she learned Yiddish. Of course, I probably can guess from her name, she's not Jewish. She comes from the Aran Islands in Ireland, another place where language is being preserved and where culture is being preserved. And she developed an affinity for Yiddish as a language of, of, of um, um, as, a, as a language of displacement, as a language of struggle. And uh, she's, she's translating Yiddish plays and trying to bring them to new audiences. So all of this is, is just, I think, the tip of the iceberg. And I, I, I think uh, if anyone cares, people who care about who we are as a people um, should care about Yiddish. Uh, and young people yeah. who want to think about how they can connect to their Jewish identity and how they can perpetuate uh, some kind of connection to Jewish culture, this is just a piece of the puzzle. Not an exclusive one, but an important one. Mm. Certainly a, a more hopeful one than, than than the focus on the Holocaust. I mean, this was the culture that existed before then. And, and it's really, it's a beautiful thing to revive it um, and to revive knowledge of it. And we should, we should be knowledgeable yeah. of it. A absolutely. And I think, you know, look, er I mean, everyone should learn about the Holocaust, but you can't build a positive... Um, and, and forward thinking uh, connection to your history based only on a story of tragedy, I don't think. I, I think of course we need to know that history, but, but I think just as critically as you point out, we need to understand what it was that was destroyed and not quite destroyed because here we are, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. we represent a story of hope. We managed to rescue all these books. We built this incredible building, which you can see, sort of see behind me. We have a 40,000 square foot building and we do exhibits and all kinds of wonderful programs. So it's, it's, a, it's a hopeful story, I hope in the end. I think so. Uh, so what kind of programs do you have? I, I heard there was a summer program to teach Yiddish to the next generation. So, right, we have a, a, a seven week um, Yiddish language and culture program for college students and, and immediate postgraduates. That's sort of our flagship Yiddish program. It's a, intensive and kids come to us for, for a seven week period and really do a deep dive. But we also do, um, we do online Yiddish classes for adults or for anyone. We have a week-long program called Yiddish School for Adults, which is just sort of a fun way to come to the Yiddish Book Center for a week and study Yiddish and just learn a little bit about what we do. And really importantly, I think, we are training Yiddish teachers. So we, we came out with this textbook because there really hadn't been a really modern Yiddish language textbook. And many people who teach Yiddish hadn't really been trained in language pedagogy, right? Just because I speak English doesn't mean I can speak, I can teach English. You have to learn how to teach a foreign language. So we're developing new Yiddish language materials for people who want to learn Yiddish, and we're training teachers so that they'll be equipped to go out and teach it. And Yiddish is now being opened at many, it is being taught at many colleges and universities around the country, and we want people to learn from the best teachers. So we're really working hard on that. Wow. So I'm just curious, are you working in connection with other Jewish, uh, Yiddish oriented organizations like YIVO or, or the Forward um, or right. you know, theater productions? I mean, is there communication between all of you or? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we all have slightly separate missions, but we work, for yeah. instance, YIVO. Um, we're currently in a partnership with YIVO the National Library of Israel and the New York Public Library to 
create what we're calling the universal Yiddish library. So we've talked about the fact that we have 12,000 titles on our website and they're available for free and, di and, and digitized. Well, we're gonna create one central website where the books from all of our collections are all available in one place. So if you're looking for a Yiddish book, you won't have to go to different places. You'll just be able to find them all in one place. And if you're a Yiddish reader, we also recently created Yiddish optical character recognition. And what that means is you can search all of the books by word. So you want to find some a name or a place, whatever you want to find, or a particular word. You type it in and it goes to the pages in those books where that word or name appears. So imagine as a tool for a researcher or you know genealogist, I don't know, any number of things you can imagine how what a tool that will be. So we're partnering with all the, those institutions and hopefully more partners going forward to create the Universal Yiddish Library. So that's just one example, <clears throat> but we also, you know, we, 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 we collaborate with others to do public programs. Um, we have a program, I don't know if you're familiar with an organization called Moisha House. It's an international organization that has sort of residences for young people in various cities. And it's a way that young people can live communally and produce Jewish programming. Well, we're doing a, a retreat at the Yiddish Book Center on Yiddish and activism for, for the Moisha House constituency. So we do we do a lot of different collaborative programs and, and certainly with, with Evo and with the forward and, and with many of our peers, the worker circle, we've done public programs with worker circle. We love to partner. And of course it's always more productive to find ways. And, you know, we'd love to partner with the braid around theater, yep. you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm just wondering, first of all, it just occurs to me that the original writers of this literature, they could never have imagined in a million years what's going on here. I mean, it, it's just mind blowing. But I'm wondering, do, are all the rights to these books all in the public domain or do you have any issues at all with rights? Right. No, we don't. I mean, there there have been so most of our works are, are, are orphan works, so they're not subject to copyright. Now, we, we, we did have, for example, just about a year ago, we worked with the Singer Estate because the Singer's Yiddish books were subject to copyright, and they allowed us to put all the books up on our, up on our website. So there are examples where we can't digitize them. We can digitize them, but we can't just put them up on the site. But, but you know it's not an issue for most of the titles that we have up on the website. That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, do you have any presence on the West Coast or are you just in Amherst? I mean, so, they're online, so. Yeah, yeah, right. So we, you know, it's funny, before the pandemic, everyone used to always say to us, you know, why aren't you here and why aren't you there? And it really, we can't be, I mean, we have our, we have our home here in Amherst. It's, as I mentioned, it's a big and beautiful facility. We have, you know, a million books and we do lots of programming here, but we've always traveled around and done programs in different places. But now more than ever, of course, because since the pandemic, like you and like everyone else, we can do all these things virtually and can reach audiences around the world. And, and of course, as I've mentioned, I mean, so much of what we do is about our digital resources and about what you can get through the website. So I think it's, it's, it's particularly resonant for us that, you know, we're really an international organization. And so we're, 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 we just try to make our work as accessible as we can. But we do come out to the West Coast from time to time. We, we recently did a film screening on the West Coast of a film that we produced um, from our oral history project called Vervet Leiben, Who Will Remain? It's about Avram Sutzkever, the great Yiddish poet. Um, and because uh, the head of our oral history project was able to interview and, and meet with the family of Avram Sutzkever. And so it's a wonderful film and that's gonna be streaming more widely going forward. But we do, so we do travel around, but really our website is the place to go and, and the schmooze and our virtual public programs and everything else we have to offer. Doesn't matter where you are, night or day, you can get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what is the future of the Yiddish Book Center? I mean, you've got so much going on now. Do you have any bold visions of things to come? Oh, yeah, well, I mean, 
You know, it's interesting. We like to say at the Yiddish Book Center, we kind of never know what's next. We sort of keep evolving and we ourselves couldn't have predicted where we would be, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. It would have been unimaginable many of the things we're doing now. But for example, um, in our building, we're actually about to open in October a brand new exhibit that's going to take over most of the space called Yiddish, a Global Culture, which is really going to focus on how much of a global culture Yiddish was all over the world, theater, um, press and politics, uh, Yiddish and the Holocaust, uh, Yiddish women writers. It's gonna be really quite expansive and exciting. And then we're gonna create a digital version of that exhibit. So you'll be able to engage with it wherever you are. Uh, we have our annual music festival Yidstock, which is really, really fun. It's a four day festival of Yiddish music. And we do get people from all over the country that come to that every year in July. And I you know, encourage you if you feel like a road trip to come out for Yidstock. <laughs> but most of all, I think, um, you know, we really, our goal is to try to uh, work with more teachers, with more, uh, with, with congregational educators and rabbis, with more young people and to partner more because we wanna find ways and leverage points. There's only so much we can do at the Yiddish Book Center. So the more that we're able to work with others, the more it, it you know, the more that we'll be able to um, expand our audience and connect to more people and engage with more people. So, you know, we've worked with teachers over time. I mean, these are the ways that we wanna try and reach broader audiences. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think we have, we're as always a bold vision, <laughs> the Universal Yiddish Library being part of it. Um, our translations, our publications, all of that uh, are, are part of how we're seeing the next few years. And hopefully, hopefully more will happen that we have yet to imagine. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, you have really done a fantastic job um, as an organization. This is really a gift to all of us. Um, anyway, I want to, before we get to the q and I personally want to thank you, Susan, for, for joining me for this conversation. And, and while I'm at it, I want to thank Daphna Schull for all her tech advice here and her work. Uh, Arva for your beautiful presentation of the poem, which was directed by uh, Susan Morgenstern, our, our, um, our producing director, and also to uh, Jessica Kurzain for permission to uh, use her translation. Um, finally, I want to give a Broisa Danka, I hope I'm saying that, a big thank you to the Yiddish Book Center uh, itself uh, for all their terrific work. So right now, uh, I'm going to hand things over to Daphna. I'm sure there are questions in the chat, so take it away, Daphna. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, lots of questions in the chat, so I'll try and get to as many as I can. A question we had uh, came in asking about what are the rarest books in your collection or ones that are most prized books in the collection? Do you oh, have gosh. <laughs> uh, that's a hard one for me to pull out of my hat. Um, you know, we have a lot of rare books in our collection. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I mentioned the Dickens one. I mean, I, I think there's like two copies of that in the world. Um, uh, I, but I really, I, geez, I'd have to get back to you on that one. And I'd be happy to, if you want to reach out to me. <laughs> okay. Well, what is your favorite book in the collection? Is that an even crazier question to ask? That you? is an even crazier question. <laughs> <laughs> there is a wonderful book that we discovered um, well, I, I actually, I, I'll talk about a category of books that I love. There are a lot of books with fabulous illustrations by famous illustrators like Chagall and many others. And I happen to love particularly the visuals in many of the books. The typography is incredible. The, there's a lot of fabulous illustrations. So I love to look at a lot of the books for their artwork. Um, and the other thing I love is the books themselves are artifacts. So I love thinking about where those books were and who read them. And oftentimes we will find inscriptions in the books or little pieces of paper or recipes, and they tell us broader story. So that for me as a historian is really fun. I like to think about where these books were. So that's not one book that's a favorite, but it's really kind of what, uh, how I like to engage with the books myself. myself. And following up to that, are there, I'm sure the answer is yes, but we had a question about um, the nonfiction books that you have in the collection. So 
how much is it historically interesting to, you know, have, uh, are there recipes from, you know, oh. the old world and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are, there are books that are in and of themselves. I mean, there are history books, there are science books, there are recipe books, there are, as I said, how-to manuals, there are citizenship guides. Those, you know, so those books are interesting in and of themselves, but they're also interesting as artifacts of their time, right? Mm. So, you know, you have a citizenship book, citizenship book, citizenship book that tells a story about how you know, what, what Jews were thinking about in, in, in terms of how to assimilate into the United States. I mean, we in fact translated one of those for our members. Um, you have uh, books for school children, you know, um, primers. Uh, I, they all tell a story, a broader story of their time. So absolutely, I, I think the nonfiction books are as interesting as the fiction, sometimes for different reasons, right? And the translations from uh, into Yiddish also are fascinating because they tell you what people were reading at that time from other cultures. So mm -hmm. Jews were reading quite widely and broadly, and we learned that by understanding what was translated into Yiddish. That's amazing. Do you, as an organization, collaborate with other organizations of different um Jewish languages? Uh, is that something that... So yeah, that's a really good question. And we get that a lot these days. So we've collaborated some with um, a guy named, a scholar named Devin Narr, who teaches at the University of Washington, Ladino, and is interested in connect, collecting Ladino books. And in fact, we did a program with him um, a, about Ladino at the Yiddish Book Center some years back, and it was one of our most popular programs. I think we are eager to both support um, the work of, of peers who are interested in working with other languages and maybe partner. Um, obviously, we're the Yiddish Book Center and that's what we do, but um, there are, I think, more than 20 Jewish languages, many of them not written languages, some of them more um, spoken, but there is a project called the Jewish Languages Project from, um, I think it's the University of Pennsylvania, Sarah Benor, who is a Scholar. She's actually an alum of the Yiddish Book Center, and she's doing a project that's dedicated to to preserving all of these Jewish languages in the world. So it, it's a fascinating project and an important one. Mm, thank you. When you first started, what was the emotional response by by Yiddish speakers who'd come to to, to so read all the books? Right. So Aaron would obviously, Aaron Lansky would obviously be able to speak to that better than I, because I was not around when he first started the Yiddish Book Center. But I think if you read his book, Outwitting History, you'll get a feel for that. I mean, it's very emotional. So, you know, people often worked very hard to afford the books, right, or to collect the books. I mean, you know, oftentimes people's libraries are very important to them. So handing over the books was, for many people, a very emotional experience. For people who come to us now, it's often a very emotional experience. They'll walk into the Yiddish Book Center and they'll look at the space, which is an incredibly beautiful space. You get a little bit of a feel for it by looking at the background behind me. And they'll say, I had no idea. Or they'll cry. Or they'll they'll see, uh, you know, they'll see that they might have at some point underwritten a shelf and that their, their grandmother's name is on a bookshelf. So it, it, it's very emotional, I think. And it's one of the things that I love about being part of the Yiddish Book Center is that it is so personal for people. It is so emotional. When people support us, they're doing it from some place really meaningful because it, come, it, it, it represents their past. It represents maybe a grandparent that they loved or maybe, maybe not, maybe they never knew their family um, who spoke Yiddish, but it, it's somehow really resonant for them. And, 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 and I, I just love that. Mm, that's beautiful. We, we have a question from our actor Arva who wants to know about advertisements of the time, like using tapeworms for weight loss. Oh, in Yiddish. Uh, oh yeah. So <laughs> Arva, I love that question. Yeah. I mean, we, so we don't, you know, we don't collect, uh, you know, there's a lot of recorded radio and so forth and so on that you can access in other places, but print ads, we certainly have. Um, and our, so our Yiddish language um, textbook, 
uh, we, we have, there's a web component to the textbook because we want people to actually hear spoken Yiddish. And we've used advertising as part of that because ads are a way, there's some fabulous ads uh, that are out there. And, you know, we have, um, we do have a lot of newspapers and journals. So we have a lot of that on site. We haven't digitized those. Um, of course, the forward, you, you know, has digitized quite a bit of material. You can see ads there, but it, it is, again, another fascinating artifact that tells a fabulous story. Mm. Uh, last question I have is, have you found any significant differences in Yiddish books from different countries or different provinces? Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, I think there, there are a lot. So, um, there are books that were published in different place, places around the world. So what will sometimes happen is um, we will get a, we will get books from Australia or from South America, and they're books we don't have because they they were published there. Many of the people who wrote these books in these different places all came from the same place, right? I mean, or from the same set of places, because it was they all ended they ended up because of, of, of the war, because of several times of, of immigration, they ended up in different places around the world, but many of them came from, you know, Poland or, or Lithuania or uh, Ukraine, what was then the Ukraine and, and many other places. So they came from the same place. They ended up in Australia or South America. Um, and so they're, they're writing from, in many ways, the same perspective, but of course there are books that come out about the experience, uh, the South American experience of, of, of Jews there. There are songs. If you go to our oral history project, you can hear, we have a wonderful interview with somebody from um, Argentina uh, who sings some songs that they used to sing in Moisesville, which was an agricultural community in South America. Um, so there are obviously differences uh, in, in, in that grew out of where Jews ended up and wrote from, but there are also commonalities because they did come from a common experience in many cases. Mm. Okay, well, we have time for a few more actually. So I'm gonna ask the next question is, were there, are there versions of books with original uh, Yiddish and then the translation on the opposing pages? So there are some um, books with translations. I think we have a few and, and we're going to be, I mean, we're putting out a book of poetry that will be, um, that will have translations. Uh, 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 so that's a, something people ask for a lot. Um, I'd have to, you know, I don't know the extent to which uh, Lisa or, or Daphna that you, you can put these people in touch with me and I can give them some, some specific recommendations, but I'd be happy to do that. That would be great. I'm getting a lot of questions about particularities of, in the book. So if you get that stuff to me, I, you know, I will try to get people the answers to the, all of those questions. All right, beautiful. So in our follow up email to everyone who is here today, we will make sure that we send any con the, the right contact information for you, Susan, so people can continue to ask questions because it's that would be great. A very hot topic. So <laughs> uh, which is wonderful. That's um, great. And the last the last question I have is how how do people support your work? Well, that's I love that question. I mean, you know, we have I mean, we so the interesting thing about the history of the Yiddish Book Center is when Aaron started out and wanted people to support the Yiddish Book Center, he went to all the big foundations and the people who were giving all the money and they all to a to a person said, why are you doing this? Why are you bothering with with this? Yiddish is dead. Go study in Israel. Go get a go teach. And but the people who supported us were ordinary people who cared about this, right? So we built a, basically what is a grassroots movement and we have thousands of members. So that is the main way that people support us. They join as members. Our bottom base membership is $54 a year. You get the Pocket Traeger magazine twice a year. You get emails and connections to everything that we do. So for, and of course, then we have major donors and major supporters at this point. But uh, you know, we were built from the ground up, and we still really rely on our members uh, to keep us going because we still don't have the support of many of the what I call the mainstream um, Jewish funders because it, it's still seen as peripheral for some reason. It's still seen as peripheral. 
But fortunately, we have many people like the people on this on this Zoom today who care about this and who are willing to who are willing to help us. Well, we're very glad that you are continuing to do your work and you push through because that is there's always there's always people who say can't be done and you're doing it. So that's thank right. you for being here. And well, thank you. And I before before you sign us off, I want to thank you for having me and uh, thank Arva for doing the wonderful, beautiful reading and for all of you for being here and listening today. I'm really, really thrilled, always thrilled to talk about our work and to meet new people, even if it is just virtually. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I also want to thank Lisa for moderating. Thank you so much, Lisa. You are fabulous as always. Ask such insightful questions and bring people some really interesting topics to discover. So before everyone heads out, I just want to do a few plugs for the braid to um, uh, let people know about things that are happening. We have our last show of our salon show out loud today, four o'clock in person in Los Angeles at Wilshire Boulevard Temple. Uh, tickets are still available. So we would love to see you there. It's a beautiful show about stories of the queer community and um, Jew Jewish stories of the queer community, but it is a universal truth, universal themes. Come see yourself in these stories as well. We are also working on our last salon show of the season called What a Surprise. That will be in May. So uh, tickets are actually available now if you'd like to, to get tickets. It's a, a show about surprises, good, bad, and everything in between. And stay tuned for more Sundays with the Braid. We will be posting new events soon. Thank you to everyone for being here. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Susan. Thank Bye. you, everybody.